Hi everyone, Chris Potts here. Welcome to the third screencast in our series on swearing. The first in the series reviewed the societal and legal background for swearing on the public broadcast airwaves. And the second reviewed a lot of linguistic evidence pointing to a specific characterization of swears as conventionalized devices for achieving specific expressive speech acts. And those acts often have taboos surrounding them. So swears are extreme cases of being able to do things with words. For this screencast, I'm going to review some evidence relating to the taboos that surround swears, swearing acts, I should say, and this will set us up well for returning to the societal and legal response that swears generally receive. To kick things off, let's consider the taboos and other social norms that surround swearing. First, the taboos surrounding swears are constantly changing along with the rest of our language. The main swears of our era traced to soldiers in World War II and made their way into general usage in the post-war years. Before that era, the prominent swears were largely oriented toward religious concepts. In this context, it's sort of informative to consider how the show Deadwood handled swearing. The show takes place in the Wild West in the 1870s, and it's full of coarse characters and coarse contexts, and swearing is a big part of constructing those identities and scenarios. But it wouldn't work well with modern audiences if all the characters said were things like damn and hell. So the show's writers updated the swearing to our modern lexicon to ensure that the swearing had the right effect on modern audiences. So that's a prominent example of how the taboo shifted over a relatively short period of time. Relatedly, if you think about the swears you know, you can probably pretty easily divide them into a taboo set and a non-taboo set, and you might even be able to rank the taboos according to the strength. Uh, in many cases, we can even identify taboo and non-taboo pairs, where you can see based on the word forms that the non-taboo one was invented in order to stand in for the more caustic taboo one. And I've given such pairs in this table here, and I'm sure you can think of others. An important feature of today's lexicon of swears in the U.S. context is that the majority of them have historical connections to sex and sexuality and related concepts. I presented evidence in the previous screencast that the present-day meanings and connotations are broader, but the historical connections are real and clearly not accidental. There are clear ties here to our society's major non-linguistic taboos, many of which concern sex. And I would be so bold as to say that this will be a common occurrence in languages and cultures. Swears will tend to have historical connections to the most taboo concepts. But many of those swears will eventually attain more general patterns of usage as kind of proper swears. In a funny twist, one of our major documenters of shifting standards around swearing is the Parents Television Council. The PTC is a conservative interest group that monitors and opposes profanity on television. And they were a force behind the FCC's changes in attitude toward fleeting expletives. And I think they remain a powerful force in generating mail-in campaigns to protest specific things that are happening in the popular media. As part of this work, though, they at least used to put out detailed reports on which swears were being uttered on broadcast TV and at what rates. So remarkably, this table here is directly taken from one of their reports. And I say remarkably because, to their credit, they didn't censor any of this. The left column here is exactly as it appears in their report. The table itself tracks usage in 2005 and 2010 at the times of 8, 9, and 10 p.m., where the thinking is that more kids will be watching earlier in the evening. And the deltas track changes in usage for individual swears. I think the main point of the table for the PTC is that most swears are being used more often in 2010 than in 2005, pointing to an increase in swearing overall. Uh, it's interesting to note the ones that are going down a bit according to these numbers, but maybe the only trend that really stands out for me is the dramatic change in the rates of bleeped versions of strong swear words. And that tracks with my own impressions where bleeping these words is increasingly being used as a comedic device that's perhaps funnier or at least interestingly different from just swearing outright. A final note under this heading, I think we're all aware that the appropriateness of swearing is highly context dependent. There are probably contexts in which even the most prolific swearers among us don't feel free to swear because of something about the context itself. And I've highlighted here some work supporting this by 
it just asks people directly about the likelihood of swearing and its appropriateness in different social contexts. And I think a lot more could be done in that mode to inform our understanding of these contextual issues. And that kind of brings me to this final short item about swearing in society, which I've put under the heading of swearing, negativity, and social bonds. My idea here is that indeed, swears are stereotypically negative, and this may even be their fundamental contribution. However, clearly, swears can be used positively, but not in all contexts. It strikes me as promising to argue that the positive uses are derived from the negative ones via emotions like solidarity, as well as general social processes that lead us to believe that very strong relationships can be tested and, in the testing, be made even stronger. So from this perspective, swears can be the equivalent of like a friendly punch on the arm, the sort of thing that's safe only among friends and serves to strengthen the friendship precisely because of the pretense that it tests the resilience of the friendship. And in, in testing it and finding that it can withstand the test, the friendship seems stronger. And that predicts that swears will be almost invariably negative or at least very transgressive where these tight social bonds just don't exist. Okay, let's move to our final phase of this unit. What we want to do here is return to our starting point, to the FCC and the Supreme Court and all that stuff, and think about those big societal issues with our stock of evidence in mind. So, as a reminder, the FCC's 2004 Memorandum on the Fleeting Expletive offers what I've called the connotations hypothesis for the F-word. Given the core meaning of the F-word, any use of that word or a variation in any context inherently has a sexual connotation. So here's my argument starting from that point, and this has some advice for everyone who's going to be involved in these debates. First, when arguing that fleeting expletives should be banned from the public airways, it's a mistake to rely on the claim that they have sexual connotations. There is no evidence that they have sexual connotations and quite a bit of evidence that they in fact lack such connotations. So just skip that silly argument. There are better ones you can use if your goal is to ban these words. But still, suppose counterfactually that fleeting expletives had sexual connotations. Or just turn your attention to taboo words that do have such connotations. Is there a good argument here for banning such language from the public airways? I say no. A lot of language that is overtly sexual or sexual by connotation is allowed freely on the airwaves. In other words, even if you weren't persuaded by my distributional evidence against the connotations hypothesis, this is a dead end for censors anyway because it just doesn't carve up language in a way that will let the argument work out. Okay, but suppose the argument is instead that it's not the sexual connotations per se, but rather the negativity of such connotations. I think this is getting closer to the truth, but that relying on connotations is still a mistake. The connotations of swears need not be negative, right? Rather, the issue is simply that these words are taboo, and breaking taboos is always transgressive by definition, right? If you lean on negativity, then surely you have to allow Bono's leaning expletive, since he was unambiguously expressing joy. So bringing in negativity is also not going to give you the outcomes that you want as a censor. So, thus, the best argument simply takes it as an axiom that these words are taboo and then builds from there. In a polite society, we seek to keep transgressions to a minimum, hence the need for special restrictions. That's the bottom line. We shouldn't have to invoke all these ancillary arguments about sex, even if the Radio Act did, because what we really want to say is that swears should be used only in specific contexts, precisely because they're irreducibly taboo. They're taboo because they're taboo. It sounds circular because it is, but so what? That doesn't change the fact that the taboo exists. I'm not sure why further justification is required. Now, it's worth listening to arguments that taboo language acts on us differently than other language, cognitively and physiologically, and thus that it is effectively a powerful kind of speech act that needs to be specially regulated. However, whatever the effects, they're mild. And so it just seems counterproductive to try to protect everyone against mild discomfort all of the time. And indeed, if we want our kids to actually learn these taboos, they're going to have to hear some swears and observe our reactions. The real danger for a kid who never hears any swears is that they'll grow up unaware of the taboos and then start swearing in a way that shocks everyone. 
So we need to do the social dance of letting kids hear and even use swears and then scolding them or at least reacting in a way that reflects the social norms. That's part of our role, I guess, as adult language users. Now, taboo violations can be funny. We don't even have to witness the violation. You just need to know it happened in some instances, as with the bleep on a TV show, which is increasingly a comedic device, as I said before. From this perspective, though, comedians looking for publicity should welcome attempts to sanction their use of swears. After all, if there were no such attempts, there would be no transgressions, and the language would you lose its power. So the weird thing about this is that one would then expect that raunchy comedians would be big supporters of the FCC, and the PTC would be a big supporter of Fox in the context of those Supreme Court cases, because Fox there was effectively working to diminish the strength of the taboos through near constant exposure. So in other words, in an odd twist, complaining about these taboo violations will ensure that the taboo items live on and retain their power. Swears violate taboos only if people bother to uphold the taboos surrounding them, and the PTC is working very hard at that. If swears are used a lot with no sanctions, then the taboos will fade, and thus there will be fewer taboo violations. And that's why I keep saying, paradoxically, the PTC might consider ensuring that more swears happen on TV in front of kids. There's no better way to drain them of their power than to use them a lot with no social consequences. But anyway, the bottom line is this. Surely everyone knows that there is little hope of change here. Testing linguistic taboos and occasionally breaking them is a normal part of being a human. If we got rid of our current taboo words, we would just invent new ones to take their place. How else would you get through all those terrible psychology experiments where they plunge your hand into ice-cold water?